There's been so many times that I've had people in my life say, either they come, this other person has a dark cloud over their head all the time. But it's on the pursuit to success. And whenever it happens, it's an opportunity to make more possible. Of what happens, it's kind of the proverbial dog that catches the car. Like, now what, right? What do I do now? That changes your entire trajectory of life on everything you do. Hey, today, friends, I have the amazing Glenn Stearns as a guest on our podcast. His story is unbelievable. It is trial after trial after trial and triumph after triumph after triumph. So listen in, get all kinds of business advice, personal life advice, just human conversation about what it means to achieve and inspire. I can't wait for you to listen. Woo! All right, friends, I have Glenn Stearns here as my guest today on the podcast. I am so excited to share all things Glenn. He recently wrote a book called Integrity, and it is all about my slow and painful journey to success. So Glenn, thank you for joining me today. Well, I am so excited to be with you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Okay, so I don't know if you know, I have seven children. Uh, so I'm one ahead of you. So I think you have to catch up. I'm getting there. I got my wife right over here. Are you ready to try again, dear? <laughs> <laughs> you can just borrow some of mine. Don't worry. You'll be fine. I'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is what I love about your story and how it hit home. I have five boys first and then twin daughters. And when I was reading through the book, I'm listening to all these things that society could have said to you and you could have internalized. And somehow you had the strength to say, no, this is who Glenn Stearns is. I might have made mistakes, but I am not my mistakes. I'm the comeback after them. Where do you think that mindset came from? It absolutely came kind of through that whole boiling frog method, right? Like it didn't happen overnight. And I'm not this really strong minded guy at 14 or at 18 or whatever, right? It's like, you know, in my life, I didn't have a lot of guardrails. I didn't have a lot of mentors. I didn't have a lot of people to set me on the right path. But I ended up um, kind of learning about silver linings, I guess you could say, right? When I was young, my my dad would maybe drink too much or whatever happened. And my mom would say, hey, let's go, kids. We're going in the car and we're going to get lost, right? And we would drive and drive and she'd pull over in some farm. Oh, no, guess what? And we're like, we're lost. And it was so fun to find your way back home. And so what I ended up learning was, man, you know, being lost isn't scary. It's exciting. Big difference. A lot of us pucker up and we get nervous. I don't want change in my life. I'm afraid of it. You know, when I was in fourth grade, I failed because I was dyslexic, couldn't really read very well. Well, now I have two sets of friends, my fourth grade and my fifth grade friends. Something good came out of it. 14 years old, I have a child, the worst thing in the world. Oh my God, my life is over. You know, and then you end up with, oh my gosh, I got a beautiful daughter. So silver linings, right? Like life became not about what happens to you. It's but what you can do with what happens to you. And, um, and I really started to look, you know, at it differently, I guess you could say life, you know, and then you get stronger because of that thickness you, your skin builds through adversity, you know? Yeah, no, I love that. I, you know, I have these kids that are nowadays like so afraid to do so many things wrong because so many consequences see, seem so heavy at the beginning, right? Like, oh, if I don't get straight A's, I can't get into school. If I don't do all these extracurriculars or volunteer, all these shoulds. And then we have people like you who have these stories that they have burned to like the flames, right? Where you would think like this would destroy me and you come back and it gives them permission to make mistakes and to be human. And I just like, honest to God, every single chapter, I like would read a chapter. I'm like, guys, 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 listen to this. Like, this is what he did. This is how it like, because you need these stories of triumph to know that that story is within ourselves. And so we borrow them from other people until we can get them ourselves. And I'm telling you, like, I, I heard you're going on Monday to talk to a bunch of school kids and I 
wish you were coming to Park City to talk to the kids where I'm at, right? Because they come from these privileged environments as most and they have so much pressure and you look at how far you've come and how much you achieved and it's just inspiring. Yeah. I'm bringing you to park city. I mean, it's just, uh, Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. And I do feel like when we get to these points where we think things should kill us or drown us or destroy us and we find out that they don't now all of a sudden it's our superpower. Now it's like, oh, try me. Are you kidding me? Like, I survived this. Like, whatever you bring me isn't going to matter. hundred <laughs> percent. You know, it's funny. I was at my university. I spoke to the business school and we walked in and it was pretty embarrassing. They had this big banner, went all the way across the entire building almost. Welcome, distinguished alumni, Glenn Stearns. And so when I went in to speak to these kids, I said, I think they got the wrong guy. You know, I said, distinguished alumni. I graduated with like a 2.1 and the dean gets up there. It was a 2.16, Glenn. We looked it up, right? And the kids in the back, they're like, there's hope, there's hope, you know? And so, you know, I speak to those guys, you know, it's like, all right, so you didn't have to have straight A's to your point. It doesn't matter to me, you know, if you go to Harvard or whatever, you know, it's, 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 by the way, wherever, you know, you go, it's more about, gosh, you know, I have roommates and boy, they let me down or I have to wake up at seven and take a class and I have a test and I have to study the night. It's about getting into the mindset of maturity and understanding, you know, how life works and what's hard and, you know, and who helps you and who's there for you and who isn't, you know, it's, it's, it's not about, you know, history and, you know, chemistry, as far as to me, it wasn't at least, you know. And I like in your story how you give us permission to not get it right the first time, right? So here you are, you move to California, you realize that the choices that you're making with alcohol and staying up late and all that kind of stuff is something you want to shift. But it wasn't like, oh, I wanted to shift and it happened, right? Like, I think a lot of us have these things where it's like, we get a nudge and then we go back to comfort. We get a nudge and we go back to comfort. And then finally that nudge gets so loud that comfort isn't an option anymore. And that happened to you in one of the stories. And I want you to go into that a little bit, because I think that's, that gives all of us permission to do the cha-cha on our, on our own pursuit, right? A couple steps forward, one back, a couple steps forward, one back, and eventually we're forward. Wow. It's, uh, you really did read the book. Thank you. Wow. I'm going to make my wife read it one day. And <laughs> Not allowed. He's teasing. He's teasing. His wife hung the moon. If you read this book, you know, his wife hung the moon. <laughs> she did. She did. She, I'm joking, of course, but, but it's, um, it's very, you know, when I, when I did re read it, when I did kind of, you go through and edit it again, right. You know, one fine, I go, wow, boy, was I in screw up, you know, like I, you know, maybe I should cut out some of these screw up stories, right? Like I have too many screw up stories in there, by the way, I have a lot more. Okay. But, um, I'm sitting there thinking, should I? And then I thought, well, but life isn't for those that think you do, you wake up and go, I'm going to, have my act together today, even though I haven't had it together my whole life. Right. But today's the day. It doesn't happen that way. I love your analogy of the cha-cha, right? Because it isn't a linear forward progression. There's always setbacks to things. Right. And, you know, my first one in my mind that just kind of was a big aha moment was when I was in college and I graduated already. And I was now I'm in the party mode. Well, by the way, I was in the party mode the whole time. I mean, I came from alcoholic parents and, you know, I learned, you know, a lot of it from looking at what was going on in their lives. Right. But, um, and so I was just a great partier. And I just remember laughing hysterically one night at, you know, my friend getting slapped by a girl or a beer thrown on him or he fell. I don't even remember that part, but I remember belly laughing at this, you know, incident at two in the morning. And as I say, I've said in my biggest of fogs, I had my clearest revelation, right? Which was, I don't want to do this anymore. I did it last night and the night before and the night before, and it's old. I don't want to live in a dark, dungy basement 
of a bar or whatever you want to call it. Because now when I think about life, it's like we have basement people. Hey, stay down here with me, man. It's warm. I, I, you know, none of us are getting out of here or you have balcony people, right? The people that pull you up, they celebrate your success. They're not, you know, mad at you for succeeding and growing and learning. And I just realized at that moment, yeah, I don't want to do it anymore. You know, I'm I'm getting tired of it. And by the way, again, to to the, your point, I didn't get out of the the basement or the bars all together right away. You know, it still took time, right? But I went to California and I moved there, which is a huge, big change. And and then I still kind of partied a little bit, you know. But I I weaned myself off of that, realizing it wasn't for me, you know. Yeah. No. And I like this analogy that you used. You have your basement people and you have your balcony people. So you moved to California. You really don't know anybody. How did you find balcony people there? You know, I was very interested, still am very in people, high achievers. And again, it doesn't matter if you're the best shoe shoe salesman, car salesman, if you're an athlete or anything, right? I love I I have I can't tell you how many times when I would say I'd be in the line. This is embarrassing, but it's just true. In um in the drive through at McDonald's, I would like a hamburger with ketchup and extra 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 mustard, and you know pickles. Okay, and I'd get there and I'd open it, no mustard on it. You know it would be that way, and then every now and then you get it and it's slobbered with mustard. And I go, I want to meet that person. And I tell them, you're going to go far. You listen, you pay attention because nine out of 10 times it wouldn't happen. It's really weird. Try that out. Go to McDonald's and order extra, extra mustard and you won't get it. You know, it's because a lot of us just go through life just doing as minimal as we can. And then there's other people that decide they're going to go out of their way to, to try to do better, you know? And so I've always been fascinated with those type of people. So I found myself in Orange County, California. I didn't know anybody, but I started seeing the people that were in all the philanthropic magazines in the back and people that had their names on the buildings, uh, colleges and all those things. I go, who are they? I want to meet those people. And then I would meet them and say, hey, would you, you want to go to lunch? You know, I, I'm, I'm new. I'm a young kid. I'm learning. And I, you know, I don't, I don't want to buy anything off me. I just want to pick your brain, see how you did this because it's not about being wealthy, but it's about having the respect of your community. You know, it's about a lot of different things that, you know, you've achieved greatness. How'd you stay there? Right. And again, it's not, not, I'm not talking about financial success. A lot of it comes with that, of course, but, you know, and then I just started surrounding myself with those type of people. And then, you know, I ended up with some pretty good mentors, you know, that, that I said, I just want to emulate. I want to be more like that. You know, again, I was doing more, less cha-cha and more long distance running at that point. Go, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You jumped in the marathon arena real fast, my friend. It's fun to read the book and watch. Okay. So while, and this was an interesting thing, because I think a lot of times we have hard decisions ahead of us. And so when you got into the businesses that you did, which was lending, you started as a lending broker, then you like someone, you, you were creative, right? You said, okay, I have these mortgages that I need to sell. I'm going to make flyers and market them to the real estate agents because I don't want to go one-to-one. I want to go to the well. I want the well to give me a bunch of business versus going one-to-one. Where, how did you come up with that? Because I don't know if everybody always can flip to that mode so fast. There's a real thing, and I, I, I'd love, I should do a study on this or something. I bet there's been one about being afraid of success, right? I think there's a lot of people out there, a lot of us, me included, by the way, afraid of what happens. It's kind of the proverbial dog that catches the car. Like, now what, right? What do I do now? And I, um, I remember when I first started doing well, I did really well. I went to this psych psychiatrist or therapist or something, I sat down with her and she says, what's going on? What's the problem? I said, well, I'm making more money than my dad ever made. I am doing really well. And for some, I'm telling you, like the other shoe's going to drop and this is going to blow up. Like I don't deserve this. And this woman, you know, I don't know why, because she, she's, 
kind of sold herself out of a job. But she says, okay, are you done? I'm like, yes. She goes, okay, I'd like you to leave my office. I said, what do you mean? She goes, leave. She goes, don't you try to set yourself and be a, you know, what's the word? Um, saboteur, right? Don't try to just sabotage your life because you're doing well. You do deserve it. You worked your ass off. Okay, so don't be ashamed about working hard and don't sit there and think you don't deserve it. You do deserve it. Now leave, right? And I was like, whoa, right? And it was really great for me because I needed that kick in the butt. And it's true. Why can't we feel good about ourselves when we try hard, work hard and risk and take chances? And so I I began to understand it was okay to succeed. And, and, and so with that mindset, what I realized I was doing you know, I would go in to your point into real estate offices and I would spend all day putting flyers in flyer, flyer, flyer. And at the end of the day, I'm like, man, did I work hard? I mean, I worked 10 hours putting flyers in real estate agents boxes, but did I get any results out of that? You know, and then I started thinking about it going, boy, that's not smart. It's hard, but it's not smart. So then I started thinking, well, why don't I go where, the action is, right? Where the actual people are that are buying homes. That seems a lot smarter than spending 10 hours putting flyers up. And so I start to do that. And I've, I've told so many people throughout the, my career to go find your buyer first, right? Go find those people. And a lot of people just are afraid of of doing that. I, and I don't understand it. It's a really a weird phenomenon, you know, but... Um, because maybe again, you might feel, or you identify your person. Yeah, no, or you de- like, so for me, I started a business that white labels an investment platform for institutions. And I remember thinking, okay, if I'm trying to get a client as an investment advisory client, where, where does this investment advising client do other services? And so I realized like, oh, if I got a relationship with a credit union, that doesn't have the same resources as a bank, right? A credit union might have 15 branches. They're not going to in-house all the layers of compliance because it's going to cause their program to blow up. So I started a company that white labels the compliance side so the credit union can label an investment platform for their membership. All of a sudden, now I have 30,000 members that need financial services, and we did a revenue sharing agreement, right? And it was because, okay, where are these people doing other things that I could get more of them? Because these are the people that I want to work with. And then what is the problem of that credit union? Well, they don't want to bring in another investment arm that blasts their name right? They want to keep the integrity of their brand and their name. So how do you piece the two together so that everybody wins and I'm the person in the middle, right? And it, I feel like you did the same thing with, okay, first you're like, okay, this didn't work. I'm, I'm working hard, but hard work doesn't always work. The hard work gives you an idea of like, okay, I need to get even better. So now I'm going to go to open houses because the buyers are at the open houses where I can get more of these people. And then you took it further and you said, okay, now I've seen this problem with titles and HUD and all these pieces. And then you started branching everybody together and you were the middleman of the collaboration, which was a fantastic, I mean, look what you did, right? I mean, it's fantastic. I look back, it was awesome. But I think it's funny on credit unions, we went in later in life in when our lending company was doing really well, we went to credit unions and said, you know, we do home loans pretty, pretty good. And you guys have all these other services. You should offer home loans. And, you know, maybe you don't want to keep those loans because that's not your main source of business, but we'll do it for you. And so we ended up with a whole credit union division and we white labeled it. We don't need to take, let them keep it, right? Let them, we just want the back end services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same business model. It's a wonderful model. And uh, yeah, I, I commend you for doing that. It's, it's smart. We, um, I just said mine is smart too, huh? If I think about that, no. No, you did. You did. I like that. We have to build ourselves up. The world's going to tear you down anyways. You're your best cheerleader, so own it. I want to know how you came with the name integrity and then you highlight the word grit. Talk to me about that, like what that means to you. There's been so many times that I've had people in my life say either they come, this other person has a dark cloud over their head all the time, or this other person has the Midas touch, right? And, you know, why is that? Why is that? And it's it's really simple. I think that when we plant seeds along our lifeline with other people, 
you either cut a little corner here and there, nobody's looking, it won't make a difference, but you'll get a little bit ahead a little faster, or you really listen to your inner voice and you know what's right and wrong and you follow what is right and wrong. And then you do the right thing along the way. And because there will come a time in everybody's life when kind of the foundation shakes a little bit and we need other people around us for support. I'm not saying you need them to lend you money, but you just maybe you need an ear, you need somebody there for moral support. And people will be there for you when you have always been there, when you've always done the right thing. But when you cut the corner, when you do things a little, when you don't keep your word, they let you drop and they just say, I don't want any part of you. And those are the guys with the gray clouds, right? Those are the guys that, that seem to have the bad luck. But it's because you've sat there your whole life and built one way or another. And I'll give you one example that it's sort of like this. You can call it karma, I guess, but it had to do with my own son. And um, he was in high school and he got himself in a little trouble with a girl. And um, he ended up getting um, asked to leave. Okay. She, the girl did not. And so I said, son, do you think what happened to you was fair? And he said, yeah, maybe. And I said, well, I think it was fair. And I'll tell you why. I said, you have, you're a good kid. You've always been a good kid, but you had 12 demerits. Your tie wasn't on all the way. You didn't cut your hair. You didn't have your shirt tucked in. 12 little things that meant nothing. They were very small things. You didn't rob a bank and you didn't, you know, do these things, but you, they were all things that added up. She had zero demerits. She was on the honor roll. He's more like me. He struggled with, with uh, academics, but um, so she's on the honor roll and has absolutely no demerits. You've got 12. So when it came time to, you got yourself in a little trouble, they let you fall. And they caught her. And that's life. Okay. That is absolute life. You, when you sit there and do the right thing and when, when it comes time to, you know, standing tall, you can do that when you know in your heart, when nobody else has been watching that you do the right thing. And so it's important, but it's also hard, right? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. I'll share an example from my story. So I struggled with fertility treatments, believe it or not. And so I got all these embryos after we finally did these like heroic measures. And I have 14 embryos. And they're like, you know what, based on statistics, you'll probably get three or four children. I've been raised Catholic. So I'm like, I can handle three or four kids. That will be fine. Four at the max. Three would be ideal. Two, I'd be thrilled. Okay, so I'm going through this process and all of a sudden I have four kids and I still have embryos and I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? Well, the choices are you donate them. So my whole life, I'm going to be wondering if my kids somewhere, they give them to you to destroy. So I'm like, okay, if I destroy this, the one child I have is going to be in a car wreck or something. So I guess I'm just, I view them as life. That's my perspective. I'm just going to use them. And it was like the universe was testing me. Like, was I really going to follow through on that? So I have seven children, right? I mean, I'm thrilled. I'm grateful. It's a lot. It's magic. But the real magic is, is that when it came push to shove, I stayed true to my word. These were life. Whatever happens is what's meant to happen. And that confidence, when anything comes at me right now, like I know who I am and I know when it gets hard, I'm going to do the right thing. That changes your entire trajectory of life on everything you do. So I feel integrity is so important. You have no idea what you just said and what it means right now. I've been looking at my wife. We had a conversation this morning in the shower. Okay, we take showers every morning together. <laughs> I love it. Relationship 101 advice on top of this whole podcast, friends. It's take showers with your loved one and life continues in the good lane. Exactly. And uh, but she had struggled with fertility as well. And we had very similar issues, very similar issues with every single thing you just said. Is, it was exactly our life. It's weird. Hell, that's exactly 
including the embryos and the frozen ones and all that stuff. Amazing. It is crazy. It is crazy. Okay. So I like, again, I have like so much to talk about in your story and I know we have to be respectful of your time, but you have this huge company that you build and then you go on Oprah, you say something you probably shouldn't have. All of a sudden these things start to unravel. Now, not all of us live a life where like Oprah gets to unravel our story, but we all have moments that we can look at ourselves and say, shit, I shouldn't have said that. And now look at the mess that I made. Tell me like how you navigated through that because the book runs through it pretty fast. Like, hey, this happened. Uh, this was terrible. But you don't really get into the, the emotional like moments of how that all played out. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You know, I was HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I was their largest contractor when it came to um, title services. So they would own property throughout the country and then they would sell it and I would escrow and do the title work on it and I would make sure they got their money. And I did that all over the country. And then I also was their largest auditor. I, I did all the audits in there with all kinds of work with with all the home loan side, right? For For that. So I had two different companies doing a lot of work with HUD. And I remember I was in with the secretary of housing and his name was Mel Martinez at the time, if you remember him. And um, then he came in and he says, he goes, Glenn, I want you to meet somebody. And he introduced me to a guy named Alfonso Jackson. I said, hello, Alfonso. He goes, Glenn, he's going to be the next secretary. Nobody knows, but I'm going to leave and I'm going to run for Congress out in Florida and he's going to take over. And then the minute he took over, he's a nice guy. He decided he wanted small businesses because HUD's for the small man and all this stuff. He's a nice guy. I'm friends with him to this day. But when he did that, he cut us out of all the contracts because I was the largest contractor and now I'm out. So I was like, oh, great. But then they call me back and they say, Glenn, you can go to Alaska and you can work with the Alaskan natives and do this partnership. And then we don't even have to, you know, put the bids out. You can just get them under this Alaskan native law that they have, which I knew nothing about. So they were educating me on it. So I went and I did all that and I began to get some contracts. And then the head contracting officer saw the Oprah piece and Oprah, what happened was she saw Mindy's ring and she's like, wow, where'd you, you know, how'd you make all that money to me? And, you know, I said, you know, I, was a waiter and I became a loan officer. I got into mortgage banking then I got into government contracting. And when I said that he went to everyone in the office and he said, you know, let's not give him any more business. We already made him rich enough. They all called me from HUD saying, this guy's after you. I was pissed. Right. I'm like, I did nothing wrong. You know, I've, and, um, so I ended up calling the inspector general I don't know if I put this in the book or not. No, you did not share. <laughs> I called the inspector general and I said, I demand you audit me. I said, I want you to audit me. And if I've done something wrong, you throw me in jail. And if I've done nothing wrong, I want a nice clean bill of health letter that says you're good. And they go, sir, nobody has ever caught us and asked to be audited. And I, know, and I go, well, I'm these guys are not giving me the contracts. And, and it's because... He says, I must be doing something wrong if Glenn's made all that kind of money and he's on Oprah, right? End of that story was uh, they didn't audit me. And, you know, the guy kept pushing his way into just saying, no, I'm not going to give you any business. And, you know, I was frustrated and it just all that work kind of just dissolved because they didn't want to give us any more business. I could have probably gone other levels and taken it places, but it just wasn't worth it. You know, I just was like, OK, you know, they've got it in for me. And, you know, by the way, they didn't just this one guy, they, kind of the head of contracting. And I'll tell you the weird, funny how things go full circle. So we were in Washington, D.C. for Horatio Alger, which I'm a member of. Wonderful organization. And I had breakfast with uh, Dr. Ben Carson at his house. And he asked me to come over because he wanted to talk to me. So, I mean, Mindy and I were up late because of the Horatio Alger. I had like four hours sleep, really tired, having breakfast. And he says, I want you to run all of the home ownership centers. You'll be like the third in charge in HUD. And I was like, wow, 
thank you. Not on your life, doctor. I will not do it. I go, I am floating around the world right now on a yacht. (laughs) And I go, you want me to come back to a job that I cannot affect change? You're asking, there's nothing there. I go, I will be your undersecretary because one day you'll probably quit and then I'll move up to secretary. And I'll do that because that would be wonderful. Kind of the thank you because I can then make change. And by the way, I was your biggest contractor, so I understand the policy side. I was your biggest on the mortgage end seller, you know, of loans on your FHA finance uh, insurance side. So I know both per- the policies, the procedures, the uh, uh, everything to do with HUD. I think I could make some good changes, and uh, and I'd love to do that. And he says, you know, he goes, I wish I thought about it. I just put that person up for it last week. And he goes, I, after I, once your name came up, I, you know, I wish I'd thought about it. I was really thinking maybe I should take the job so I could go back to that one contractor and go, now I'm your boss. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? I mean, it's so true though. Like there's one person that could just be a thorn in our side and there is some gratification knowing that you could full circle close it, but just knowing it doesn't mean you have to execute it. Right. Which is where you're like, okay, I know I can, I don't have to like the knowing's enough. I mean, and it was really, to your point, I almost, I really thought hard about it. But what happened is I said no. And he says, play me in a game of pool for it. This is at like 8 a.m. Oh, yeah, you won. Yes. yes. And I know. So I played him in pool and is downstairs. And, uh, you know, I, I said, look, all right, let me shake your hand. And I go, all right, this is the deal. If I win, I don't, you know, take the job. And I go, but if I lose, I don't take the job, right? Like, cause I'm not taking, you know, and I had won too. So, uh, but it was fun. You know? Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. Hey, you know, what's funny. I want to, I want to ask you something. If you yes, please. So I understand that you climbed all the seven summit, all that stuff. Do you know Kit Delore? No, I don't. No. So Kit was um, a woman that lives in Jackson Hole and she also did the same thing, but she skied down them. She's at some weird record of, Oh, so she did the seven summits. Yes. Oh, it's seven. You did the seven second summits. Well, I have one, I have one left and then I'll be the first female to do the seven second summits. She did the seven summits and skied down all of them like a total badass because she is one. So yes, I've heard of her. I haven't met her. Yeah, no, she's, she's an amazing lady, but I can't believe you have one left to go to hit that. That is amazing. Yeah. I'll tell you a little bit on the story. Okay. So I leave next week, Tuesday which is like, and I go to Mount Logan, which is um, the second highest peak in North America. We were there last year due to weather. We were pulled off two days before hitting a summit. So extremely frustrating because now I know what I'm walking into. Like I know the struggle. I know all the uck, but I'm super excited about it because this pursuit started from a car accident right? That should have taken my life and didn't. When I had a second chance at life, I was looking at what I was doing before and it just wasn't as fulfilling. And so I'm like, I want to do something where I can make impact, where I can inspire, where I can empower people. Like I'm a mom of seven and I can still do what lets my heart on fire. So you have no excuses to do what lights your heart on fire either. And so I started on this pursuit and I am telling you, it's been like one humbling, this is real life pinch after another. And I have one mountain left. I cannot wait for it to be done. And the stories that have happened through me because of the pursuit have been magic, just flat out magic. Actually, I'm going to share one with you because I know Mindy's in the background and she's like a beautiful supermodel. So this is funny. So Mindy, I'm interviewing companies to climb Mount Everest because Mount Everest, yeah, Mindy, get in the picture. So Mount Everest is my training for K2. And so I'm calling companies. I'm like, okay, I have long blonde hair. I need a hair dryer. And so the first company says like, you need a hair dryer? Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, I'm going to get sick. Like my hair won't dry in 24 hours if I don't have a hair dryer. So the second company I call and I said, hey, listen, can I bring a hair dryer? Like, yeah, you could probably use the generator once a week. And then the third company goes, do you need a mirror? 
And I'm like, that's the company I'm going with. The company that says, do you need a mirror? Like, like customer service self, right? So then I am like a little embarrassed that I'm drying my hair at base camp and I'm using a solar powered battery. So I can't like hide in my tent. I have to do it out in the open where everybody can see. And it was, yeah, I mean, I'm like, hey, listen, it is what it is. This is what I need to do what I'm going to do. And then I went to the next mountain and I had no less than 10 women come up to me and say, hey, Jen thank you for drying your hair at Everest because it gave me permission to be a female in this environment where we always try to be these mini males. And I'm like, yeah, ladies, we're doing this, right? And it's so true. And it, that's the truth. Like when we step into our purpose and see it as like, here, I'm here to serve. And here's what I need. The universe provides, right? And like, I look at the story of you two and it's so well like written in this book. And it just, it warms all of us that one, like failure happens, but it's on the pursuit to success. And whenever it happens, it's an opportunity to make more possible. So we look at your story, Glenn, of when, okay, you sold the company to BlackRock and then you have to sit there and watch you not be able to make impact in a company that you built from ground zero, which I can't even begin to sit with because I just, I, I can, I know I've built a company. Like if I had to watch that company get just fall up, I mean, I would be throwing up, right? It would be make me physically sick. And then instead of letting that define your story, the two of you start kind lending, right? I'm like, what? Like, oh my God, I just like want to like all day long. You have no idea. It's so amazing. It was absolutely, you know, a lot of times you look at things and, you know, I, I've never had a baby, but I can tell you that, you know, there's so many She's times. She's had seven. Seven babies, seven summits, right? One you do for one every for every, that's really cool. Yes, yeah, seven continents, seven continents, seven. That's my triple seven. And what a lot of people don't realize is, those second summits, a lot of them have killed more people than the one, you know, they're, they're very dangerous. People don't understand. Oh, you think it's second. No, it's badass. Okay. Um, even if you are drying your hair out in the middle of freaking Mount Everest, right? I'm you sorry. Know? That's pretty badass right exactly. there, in my opinion. Exactly. But yeah, no, you know, it was, um, it was a little, you know, I think I, if I can speak to that, you know, it was something that, you know, when you sell your company, you think you've reached the pinnacle, you've gotten to the height of your success. Someone values your work. Someone has told you that what you've been doing is worthy of their investment in their time. And that it was, should be a very big moment to celebrate. And it was a very bittersweet moment because it was something that he recognized like, wow, I'm, I'm really hoping this can take our company to the next level and really do good on the people and what we've created. And, and I think it was just hard to let the reins go and not be in charge of the culture that he had created and wanted to keep that same kind of family type of feeling. And, um, you know, when he had the opportunity to do it again, he's like, I don't have an exit strategy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back. I'm going to do it how I want to do it. And I'm in it for the long haul because I love the relationships I created. And, you know, I'd been part of it more in an ancillary way over the first, first round. And then, so this time he says, I really want you to be part of what it is. Cause you know, my, my area is people and relationships and, and entertainment and culture. And so that's kind of where I came in. And you, you know, it's funny is, so this time, think about this, right? All right. So you, you, I had an exit that was a dream exit for most people, right? Most people think this is the dream exit, right? Definitely. Right. right. Very, very wonderful exit financially. That day that it closed, she'll tell you, worst day of my life. Cried Buffed like it. a Buffed baby, right? Like I know, I knew, and I know I let a lot of people down that hung in there for 20 years. It was, it was, I sold out. Okay. Now I say that, but I mean, I was going through cancer. My mind was like, I'm going to focus on my family. I would not change a thing. However, um, it wasn't a good day. It wasn't like you ring the bell or right, life is good. Right. It didn't happen that way. And so then when Blackstone decides to take it a path that, um, that they have every right to do, they paid a lot of money for and they can do what they want. But when it's your name on there and it's all that and you watch it, it's, it's hard. Okay. And so the minute again, they did what they needed to do and that they, they don't, hide behind things. They don't make any mistake about what they do. They, they do what they do, even though you, you know, maybe people would say that feels unethical and that doesn't feel right. It's just, it's not it's another way of doing business, but, 
I thought I was partners. I was more of a pawn to be able to be moved around in that deal. And that's okay. Again, I'm, I accept it. I didn't know it, but I accept it. So, but I was pissed off, right? So I'm going to go, we got an opportunity. Let's go off and let's do it our way. Nah, nah, no more of this tie. And I've got to march the same way every other lender's done. Why? I've got now the confidence to do it the way we want to do it. And I hope we can attract people. If you're going to spend 10, 12 hours a day in uh, your industry, working your tail off, let's have some fun, right? So I asked her to come along. I want you to be the chief happiness officer. Right? I know. I love it. It's so good. He's like, she gets up there. We probably have 150 people when we get started out the gate. She's like, hey, everybody, I'm your chief ho. That's right, everybody. Hey, uh, I'm sleeping with the boss. It kind of sort of worked, right? Yeah. Woohoo! It's perfect. It was so good. I love it. And you talk about that in the book, and I like, I laughed out loud. It was awesome. And then you we know, got HR. Okay, we're kindness. I'll be the chief kindness officer, but I love yeah. telling the story. It's perfect story. But you want people to let their guard down, be able to laugh a little, have fun, you know? And I didn't like it when people got nervous. Oh my God, here's the boss. No, no, no. I want you to be able to just come in and give me a hug and say, you know, we had a tough day today or whatever, you know? And, but, but don't be all nervous, right? Like let's all, we're all in this together, man. We work our tails off and it's a family. And so I wanted to keep that feeling. And so we do it through laughter. We do it through some fun. You know, in, in our wholesale side, we have a portal that all the brokers have to use. And we wanted it fast and we wanted it easy. And um, so we called know, it the quickie. The quick Yes, yes, the quickie. It's so good. <laughs> no, I love it. And here's like the interesting thing that I think all of us can gather from this interview today. Those of us that have been to the summit or to the destination, right? Like sold the company or got to the top of the mountain or got to this point that we wanted to get to. Once we're there, we realize that it's not the destination, it's the journey. So then when we get to do it again, right? So now you're building kind lending. You get to do it again. You're sitting there thinking like, okay, we're going to be successful. The question isn't whether we're successful or not. The question is, is how much fun do we have in the pursuit? Because that's the win. How many people can we see? How many people can we empower? What impact can we make on our daily life? Because the destination's already written in stone. So now it's like, how do we enjoy the pursuit? And I think that's what your story has been a testimony of. And it just gives people an idea of like, okay, guess what? Here's a guy who took it all the way to the end and realized like, guess what? This is, there's a better way. And we're going to do it again with that better way and give you a business model to replicate in whatever industry you're in. And that's, I, that's one thing to really be celebrated about the both of you. Oh, yeah. no, thank it's, you. it's, you, you nailed it. You really did. It's like, you know, when I looked back on the last journey and I thought, well, actually how it happened was I used to say, oh my gosh, 2007 and eight, I never want to relive that again. Right. That was the financial crisis. We were, you know, it was, a, and then. I get hit with cancer. Oh my God, I'm going to die, right? I got a 50-50 shot at this. The, besides my children, besides, you know, these very close, important things, like what was it in my life? Wow, I, what I would do to live through 2007 and eight again and fight those battles with Wall Street. You know, it was, and it was actually kind of, in a weird, sick way, fun, you know, like to have to have your back against the wall. Well, that's what you look back on and you build your stories from, right? Like what I, I mean, I should have died in that car wreck and I didn't. So all of a sudden that changes everything because you no longer label things good or bad. You label things as like, I get to experience this. Like I remember getting a call from the principal's office and the principal's like, you sound a little happy for this phone call. I'm like, you don't understand. Two months ago, I might not have been here for this phone call. So just being here is magic, right? And that first check, like it just changes who you are. And I think, Glenn, like reading this book, your superpower has been acceptance. You've accepted who you are. You've accepted the situation. And the minute you accept the situation is the minute you have power to shift it, change it, or do something different. And in all of your stories, it's been like, okay, this was the situation. I've accepted it. I see what it is. Now I can move forward. 
And I see that time and time again in this book. It's he, interesting you say that because I will say attest to that because when he got cancer, he's just like, okay, now I know what I'm fighting. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to do what I need to do. Okay. I can't eat now. Okay. Now what am I going to do to get my new, like he takes every time he doesn't dwell. He doesn't think so, how it could be. It should be. It but would be. He just, goes I th- forward. but I think it's we'll very simple to just do one of two things. If you can't, control it at all if it has not you know if you are in if you don't have any control why do you spend one ounce of time on it because there's it doesn't do you any good okay and going back to your your car wreck one time i was um in a car with a friend when we were younger my car he was driving and i remember that um we were going to go home but then i start going burrito 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 like we like we got to go to go get a burrito at 7-eleven at two in the morning you know one of those late nights burrito 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 but as i kept going burrito 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 he kept going faster 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 i went burrito 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 and then he tried to turn a corner didn't turn the corner didn't go broke all the wheels it was a very bad wreck and i got out of the car and i'm like I'm alive. I'm alive. And I started running around the car. I'm alive. I'm alive. And this guy was so mad that he just totaled my car. I didn't even spend a second on that. I was just like, he got mad at me because I wasn't oh, mad. You're we got in a big fight, by the way, he got in a little trouble, but we got in, we got in, in a big fight standing there because he, I didn't get upset about it, right? You know, and it's like well, that's looking at the, the silver lining. I can't do anything about it. That's a superpower. That's a superpower. Yes. Wow, this impressive. You're impressive. You uh, you have an yeah. impressive story. It's an honor to meet you. So do you both. I'm telling. Like I li- I'm like I told Scott Miller. I'm like, listen, I'm gonna meet this guy and I'm gonna tell him I'm at his service because I love everything he stands for and I'm just gonna support him and I'll show up anywhere you need me to help because it's so inspiring what you guys do. <laughs> so. Well, I can't wait to come to Park yeah. City because I'm a big skier. I love that place. You'll get him in the schools. We'll we'll get you there. There for sure. Do a little cha-cha-cha. <laughs> cha-cha-cha. Yeah, cha-cha. Woo! Yes, let's do it, my friends. Cha-cha-cha. Okay, so this is Glenn and his wife, Mindy. And we are so lucky to have you today. The book comes out. Everybody's buying it. If you want a copy, call me. I'll buy you a copy as a gift because that's how much I love it. And yes, yes, we both have our copies right here. Woo-hoo! Very nice to meet you. Enjoy this. Appreciate your support. Thank you guys so much.